Coming up. Engine begging to be saved. Actual fire heated seats. An unusual activity. Major issue, fellas. Sup? So, I'm in a situation where I need a daily for my daily. You know what I mean? Been daily driving my 2001 E46 325i Touring with the 5-speed manual, better known as Project Cologne for the last three years, and I'm ready for a change. I want something a bit faster, a bit bigger, but most importantly, more comfortable. Behind these doors is just that. So let me show you what we got. Project Cologne is not going anywhere. It's not for sale. I adore that thing, and we're still going to do the 330i swap at some point, hopefully this century, minus the supercharger, because we're going to supercharge the thing that's behind these doors. Also, like what you see, brand new merch. Check it out. Now let's go inside, because it's pretty cold outside. Not that it's any better inside. I turned the lights off for a dramatic effect. Might even cue some music. There's the Alpina in its beautiful brand new paint. Project Carzu and of course Project Marseille. <laughs> anyway, Project Rottweil is right around the corner. It's been hiding there for quite some time. No, that's not it, that's Project Hovde. That poor thing has been sitting for far, far too long. Project Rottweil is right over there. Can you tell what it is? Is that? It is! 2003 E39 530i Touring. And it looks like it's finished in Toledo blue over gray leather interior. And it is, as you would imagine, extremely broken. But all is well because it has a heated steering wheel. I give you a heavily neglected and broken 5 Series Touring. That doesn't stay up, so I gotta use this flimsy stick. Parts, we're gonna start wrenching immediately. But first, I need to replace the battery because it's completely dead. In the meantime, my chief editor can tell you the story of how I ended up with this fine automobile. A while back, one lovely Patreon, Timo, gifted me his 1998 E39 528i Touring. At the time, I couldn't keep it, so I gave it away to another Patreon, Louis, who fixed it up and racked up many more kilometers with it. That Touring is living a happy life with Louis in Spain at the moment. Anyway, driving that car back to the workshop, the sound of the silky smooth rev happy six cylinder, beautifully well put interior, the general feel of robustness, and the sheer amount of comfort while driving down the road, it just hit me why I fell in love with the brand in the first place, and how much more comfortable E39 is compared to my E46, specifically on the Autobahn at higher speeds. My first oil leaking machine was a 2002 E39 530i, and that's the car that started everything, that took me all over California reliably in comfort, and the car that I learned to wrench on. One night I was curious to see what was being offered for sale when I came across this diamond. Twin to my original E39, Toledo blue over grey leather interior, except this one is a touring and exactly what I wanted. Facelift, 530i, no sunroof and beautiful color combo. It was listed by a dealer in the town of Rottweil and upon calling and asking basic questions, I was told it was in good condition. And here's what that condition looks like. We have rattle at the bottom. Have you ever seen this? Sparks in the seats. You drive it and it fries your ass. How convenient is that? Look at it. It's gonna set itself on fire. good isn't it this is the point where the buyer would yell at the dealer and drive home in anger after wasting six hours driving back and forth to see it but not this idiot this idiot was excited as i found a true diamond in the rough it's practically brand new except it's not 218,000 kilometers check engine light is on why wouldn't it be just listen to it 
purrs like a kitten. My biggest concern was rust, but to my surprise, it has minimal rust for a German driven E39. The biggest part is this one here. And of course, the tailgate and the trunk hatch. That's the number one rust spot on every E39 Touring. So these will need to be addressed. It's not what you think. But all other common E39 rust spots ain't rusty around the fuel filler cap, side skirts, rear arches, bottom of the doors, jacking points, the floor of the car. It all looks unbelievably rust free. It left me a present, which is incorrect. Coolant. The paint itself is in terrible condition. We have weird hand print stains all over. 184 dents covering every panel. Deep scratches and the right side of the car has been keyed naturally. The front bumper scuffed up pretty badly. The same goes for the rear one. On the plus side, it's all original paint. It was never repainted and we are going to try and salvage this paint with the exception of the bumpers and rust. Those parts need to be repainted. Then we have rusty brakes. Both power folding mirrors are broken. Headlight covers are weathered as well as the inner taillights. Windshield seal is disintegrating and the pixels are out in the cluster. Just to name a few issues. The interior is, as you would expect, cleaned and detailed. No, it's disgusting. But what attracted me the most, besides being neglected, which is my favorite type of condition and not a rust bucket, is the equipment. This specimen is one of the most well-equipped E39s I've ever seen. We have factory installed high glass shuttle line window trim, a very rare option on non-M Sport Touring, a heated steering wheel, big navigation, heated and active comfort seats with lumbar, rear window shades, electrochrome power folding mirrors, tow hook, and my favorite, it's a slick top. Yes. I wanted this thing. The asking price of 4,450 euros was optimistic to say the least. And when I went back to their office to discuss the price, they told me the last price is 4,000. To which I said, I'm not sure I'd pay 2,000 for it. The lady laughed me out of the office and told me this isn't a car for me, that it's not meant to be put back on German roads, and that it's for export sale. In other words, this car would be scrapped or parted out. I wasn't ready to give up just yet, so I started texting with the dealership owner and I offered him a cool 1,500. And shortly after we agreed on 1,600 European bucks. From being stuck rotting away for the last few years at the end of the lot and destined to never see the road again, suddenly the future of this E39 never looked brighter. It had three previous owners, came with four keys, letter pouch with all the books and manuals including the original service book and the sales contract from 2015 where it was sold to the last owner with 137,000 kilometers for 6,500 euros who then successfully destroyed it. All things considered, this was actually a pretty good deal. A lot of car for the money. Anyway, time to start restoring this beauty back to its original glory. I started off by cleaning up the engine bay before pulling it into the shop. I can't believe it, but the AC actually works. Broken cats. The first thing I want to find out is if the engine is any good. So we are going to perform a compression test. Properly nasty. Man, I missed working on E39. The clips for these ducts here are usually broken. You have to rotate them and then take them out. And people tend not to do that. And these are intact. Look at that. Nice. Nice. Mustard. Not terrible, but they definitely need to be changed. This one is a little bit gummed up. Let's see what the cylinders look like. Carbon on the pistons. And then we have nice cross hatching on the cylinders. This looks great. This one looks great as well. Nothing out of ordinary here. All right, I pulled the fuel pump fuse. Now I'm gonna connect the compression tester. And we are looking 
anything above 10 bar, and most importantly, consistency across all cylinders. Between 12 and 13 bar, that's excellent. All of the cylinders are between 12 and 13 bar, which is healthy for an old unit. The indestructible M54 engine, hands down one of the best engines the BMW ever built and one of my favorites. I love this six cylinder engine. Brand new spark plugs. Before we drain the oil, I want to run the engine flush, so I'm going to put back the ignition coils. I think it has an exhaust leak as well. The engine is now nice and warm, so we're going to put engine flush from Liquid Molly. Cheers. Now we're going to let it work for about 10 minutes. Remove the oil filter so that the oil from the oil filter housing can drain into the pan. Oh no! What a... Major issue, fellas! We have an oil leak. Just kidding. BMW without oil leaks, like beer without foam. That's how you know it's good. Come, come closer. As you would expect, it's delicious. We have a coolant leak brewing here as well. We have all sorts of good leaks going around here. I would like a refund, sir. You sold me a car that leaks oil. Time to do the tour of Rottweil. Let's start where the action is, aka oil leaks. That's our coolant leak. The temperature sensor over there is leaking. There's a small O-ring. Not a big deal because we are replacing the entire cooling system. Power steering line is leaking right over there. Oil pan gasket is leaking. Probably also the oil filter housing gasket. Broken lower part of the fender liner. All of the control arms look original. Gonna replace all of that. Here pretty much the same, the brake rotor is incredibly rusty. But no worries, we are upgrading the brakes. More leakiness here, hopefully that's just the oil pan gasket and not the rear main seal, but we'll see. The transmission, however, bone dry. Flex joint is shot, has a lot of cracks and I can see fibers coming out of it. And now the chassis, usually every, well, almost every, E39 that's been living in Germany all its life is a rust bucket from underneath, but not this one. I can't believe it. I mean, there is some small surface rust here and there, like you can see that over there, but that's nothing. I mean, look at the pipes, and most importantly, look at the jacking points. Usually these are completely rotted out. Here's one over there, looks excellent. Another one over here, more goodness on this side. The side skirt as well, without any rust. It's just pretty unbelievable. You can see a little bit just starting there, but we can put fluid film and stop it from spreading. Oh, here as well. Again, this is nothing compared to what you usually see on German cars. Diff, a bit rusty and leaky apparently. The rear suspension, we're gonna overhaul here everything as well. That's the airbag, rusty exhaust, but the floor looks really good. All around. Pretty decent. And where the Tourings, E39 Tourings usually rust, are the points where the subframe connects to the body. And this one actually looks decent. That's one of the things that I checked when I bought it. You can see something a little bit here and there. We're just gonna coat the entire underside with fluid film or some rust protective film. And that's gonna stop rust from eating this car altogether. So it's actually pretty solid. In Germany, this can pass as rust free. Gerard Butler. 
Okay, fellas and senoras, this car is going to get a thorough service. First thing we're going to do is replace the valve cover gasket and overhaul the Vanus unit. So I'm going to start taking apart everything around the engine so we can have nice and easy access. Oh, we have a zip tie here. There's another one over there. Looks like a professional zip tie player worked on this car. The fan clutch. Oh, really? Was it that easy? Drain the coolant. Kind of need a new fan shroud. More zip ties. The guy was really dedicated to his profession. <laughs> Original and very much shot. Miley or Mele garbage. It's going straight into the trash can. This one is original. I'm going to remove the radiator as well. Have more space. Compressed there. Blow out the dust. What do we think? Will it be like Project Cologne, full of varnish and sludge? My money is on varnish and sludge. What? Yep. Say hello to varnish. Further proof that this car was neglected and abused. This is what happens when you don't change oil regularly. You get varnish all over inside of the engine. A little bit of sludge as well. That being said, it's not as bad as Project Cologne. That thing had massive chunks of sludge stuck in the cylinder head. This one is not as bad. The camshaft looks perfect on the bright side. The intake side camshaft looks perfect as well. Anyway, let's remove the Vanus unit. We're gonna have oil here. Now you're gonna pull out the caps. Here we have left-handed threads, meaning we undo the bolt clockwise. Disconnect various connectors. Vanos line. Yep. Now we're going to rebuild the Variable Nockenwellensteuerung, better known as the Vanus unit. We are going with Bissan parts that Jörg from Propstentech kindly provided me with. Propstentech is Bissan's sales partner for Germany and Europe. Jörg has been rebuilding Vanus units since 2008 with their parts and knows everything and anything when it comes to Vanus. There are many kits out there available for this repair, but the majority of them are of subpar quality. Jörg explained to me how the use of poor quality materials used in those kits can lead to premature failures and actually cause irreparable damage to the Venus unit. He has a phenomenal write-up on his website showcasing the damage and how a ring made of soft material fails. On the other hand, in all these years they never had any failures on units rebuilt with B-SUM parts. I highly recommend checking him out and getting a kit or a rebuild service from him. The link is in the description. First we're gonna remove the camshaft sensor. This is the intake side and that's the exhaust side. Yep, the seals are shot. Look how much play we have here. This one has a spring, so it'll want to pop up. Let's check out this one. Yep, way too loose. Let's inspect the bores for wear. Should be nice and smooth. As it turns out, this unit is bad. More on that in a bit. Now I want to take this apart completely and then we can put it in the ZZ machine. Okay, I should have loosened these while the Vanos was still bolted to the engine.
And that's the Venice unit completely disassembled. And what I would love to do here is put this in the vapor blasting cabinet and make it look all nice and shiny. But we can't do that, it's far too risky. We have small passages all over the place and media can get stuck in there and then it's gonna be a nightmare. So instead we're gonna put this in the ZZ machine. The results are in and we have a problem. This Venice unit is not usable. This board here is damaged. I can see and feel obvious imperfections in the surface and this should be smooth as glass. They're like deep scratches or valleys or something. This is gonna be a bit difficult to show on camera but you can see the lines right over there. They are deep, like scratches and I can feel them with my finger. With that in mind, this unit is not usable and we're gonna put all of this on the side. Thankfully I have a spare unit that we're gonna open now and inspect and Hopefully we can rebuild that one. This is a used unit that I bought a while back. This one supposedly has around 180,000 kilometers. Wow, I was told that it was untouched. Super, super loose. Let me try the old one in there. Oh, this one feels better. Now let's see what we have here. This one is smooth as glass. No lines, no damage or anything like that. Here's the thing, I'm comparing the old unit with the new one here, and the one that I took off the car is in far worse condition than this one. And actually someone was already in here messing with stuff. You can see marks on the bolt here clearly. So someone at some point probably rebuilt this unit. And this piston here scored all around. While this one, is squeaky clean. Someone might have used wrong parts or rebuilt it incorrectly, which resulted in all of this damage and those lines on the inside of the Vanus housing. Here's another thing. On the right is the cover of the old Vanus unit and on the left is the new one. And you can see a clear difference in the surface here. This one is a lot rougher. It's not smooth, it has more scoring marks while this one is well, mirror finish, and that's how a good Venice unit should look like. The ZZ machine. The most important thing here is to use a degreaser that's not going to damage aluminum in any way. I tried a few different things and some of them discolor it. One of them even starts eating at aluminum, and that's really bad. It's something you don't want, especially when you have finely machined and polished surface like covers and housing of the Venice unit. So I got a tip from a nice subscriber to use this dusty used for degreasing and it's safe on aluminum i've been testing it as well and i cleaned the other cover with it in here and it didn't touch aluminum at all it just cleaned it and that's exactly what we want this has been cooking for about 35 minutes look at the cover nice i ended up talking to jurg and he told me that it's quite common for him to find scored and pitted vanus units it all depends on the service life of the car the oil change interval and what kind of oil was used so if you're doing this job inspect the vanus unit thoroughly make sure there's no damage of any sort and if you find something you can reach out to jurg and he'll probably be able to help you out because he has a lot of spare parts this unit is thankfully in really good condition but i also got to thinking why don't we polish the surface here and I asked Jörg about this and he told me that's in fact one of the things that he does because this is where the o-ring seal and I already went ahead and polished this one here and it looks perfect, really nice and shiny and now the surface is smooth which we want for a perfect seal. So some simple metal polish, fresh carbon fiber and now I'm going to go over this cover and Vanus housing as well. Before this is how it looks now. We're gonna thoroughly wash this. We gotta make sure we remove all of the polishing compound. I'm gonna do the same with the housing. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Now we're gonna do the anti-rattle repair. This is the intake side piston. Side to side play here is normal, but we are looking here for axial play. So if I rock the piston like this and hold the shaft in the back, it shouldn't have any play. If it does, that means that the bearings inside are shot. So this is normal, but if I hold the shaft in the back and I would try to do this, that is not good. That is too much play. And that's what we want to fix. Rubber for safety.
washer, needle bearings, uno más washer, there it is, and there should be another washer. Now I'm going to go clean this, that's nice and clean, new bearing, new needle bearings, so those are the new parts, the rest we're going to reuse, so I'm going to clean them. I'm not going to coat the inside of it in oil right now, in order for us to check for play correctly, it needs to be dry, if everything is okay, then I'm going to submerge all of this in oil. Bearing. Make sure it's fully seated. I've set the impact to the lowest setting and we're gonna do quick three clicks. That's it. And now I'm gonna hold it. And we have no axial play whatsoever. And this is actually not good. This shouldn't be this hard to turn. Further adjustment is needed. Now we're gonna take the center washer. Per B sand repair instructions, we're gonna take 400 sandpaper, place the washer on it, and move it up and down for about 10 seconds with moderate pressure, then rotate it 90 degrees, repeat that for another 10 seconds, and then flip it on the other side and repeat the same process. Now I'm gonna wash this out with brake cleaner. Nope, still not good. So I ended up consulting with Jorg about this and he told me that from the factory, all of the parts internally have different tolerances. So I took apart the old piston from the old Vanos unit and took that washer and it's actually thinner than the one that came from this one. Uh, this one is 3.28 and the one that I put in now is 3.27. And now it's rotating freely. Otherwise I will be sending this washer for days. Still no axial play, which is the important bit. And it's rotating freely, so this one is done. This is the second piston. I ended up using 180 grit, then 400, and then 1000, because this one was difficult to rotate as well. And now it's perfect. I put it on the intake side, because on the exhaust side I can't hold the shaft. It's not long enough. And let's see, axial play, beautiful. Now we're going to replace the seals, and the easiest way is to simply cut them and then break them. There's another one underneath. Plastic fantastic. Now you're going to clean the piston and the grooves. Oil and clean gloves. I like to make one full circle and make sure that the o-ring sits properly. Very good. Now I'm going to repeat the same with the other one. Now we need to resize the Teflon seals. We're going to pop it in for about two minutes. We can do the same here with the top one. Let that sit for about two minutes as well. Now just go around and make sure that the seal is sitting straight, which it is. Beautiful, straight as an arrow. Brand new plugs. You're gonna replace the stock O-rings that come on them with the upgraded Viton ones as well. Reassembly time, fogging oil for men. Spray inside of the piston. Clean gasket. Spring. So for the Vano solenoids, I actually forgot to order the O-rings, but here's a nice tip. Buy yourself a box with O-rings, preferably ones that are good quality. And this one happens to have the exact one that we need, 21 millimeter in diameter and 2.5 millimeters in thickness. And that's this guy here. 
We're gonna torque the Vanna solenoids once the Vanna unit is back on the car. I'm gonna use thread sealer on the screw plugs. Pay attention, thread sealer, not locker. I don't want these guys to leak. Good and tight. Brand new original camshaft position sensor for the exhaust side. And it doesn't come with an O-ring. Of course it doesn't, but I think I ordered it. Bit of oil. And that, ladies and gents, is in-depth and how to properly rebuild a Vanus unit on M54 engine. Well, we have nice and easy access. I'm gonna replace the intake camshaft position sensor. Make sure to get the O-ring as well. Again, brand new original part. Couldn't find the OE one. And for the camshaft position sensors, you have to use either OE, in other words, original part, with BMW logo scraped off, or original, nothing else. Put a replica in there and the car is not gonna work properly. The engine, that is. Brand new gasket. According to TIS, these are torqued to 10 millimeters, but they are so easy to snap, I'm just not gonna risk it. I'm gonna go by hand and I can feel when the bolt bottoms out, I'm not gonna push it past that point and it's torqued properly. Like that, that's it. Lubed up caps, rotate them left to right to make sure they're fully seated. Brand new plugs. Let's tighten up the van of solenoids before we forget. Excellent. Plugs in the bolt here we're gonna do a bit later because we still need to remove a lot more stuff in the front of the engine. Let's poke some sludge. Would anyone like a piece of sludge? It's like fudge, except it's not. Okay, I poked and vacuumed all of the sludge that I could get to. That is a sentence you don't wanna say when working on an engine. I cleaned up the valve cover and the cam cover as best as I could, but this varnish is like rust. It's really difficult to remove. Now we're gonna apply RTV on the half moons and where the Vanos meets the head. I prefer to smear it with my finger and remove the extra. In the back as well. Easier than on E46, because you have more space. Now we're gonna go in a crisscross pattern from inside to out and slowly tighten the valve cover. The torque for the valve cover bolts is 10 millimeters, but you don't really need a torque wrench here because you will simply feel when the bolt bottoms out and you can't go any further like here. That's it. Sometimes it's better to go by hand because the head is aluminum and you can strip the threads really easily. Brand new oil cap. Brand new Bosch ignition coils made in Slovenia. The connectors we're gonna do a bit later. Now we're gonna set about replacing the belts, pulleys, thermostat, water pump, oil filter housing gasket, power steering reservoir, power steering lines, remove the intake manifold, replace the coolant pipes that run underneath it, CCV, rebuild the diesel valve, and million coolant lines around the engine. Look how cracked the belt is. Ah, oh, Miley again. I don't like Miley, Miley, however you pronounce that parts. Had too many of them fail and I simply don't use them. Someone changed the power steering fluid. And look at this pulley. It is shot.
This is not the original unit. Can't rebuild it. This is Vico. And uh, yeah, look at that. It's bad. You can't close. Look at that. Yep, that's a bummer. I'm trying to be nice here and not break you. You're not giving me any choice. Who that is some firm plastic, man. There we go. Disconnect right. the fuel line. I thought the throttle body could come together with the intake manifold, but nope, sure can't. Throttle body removed. Let's connect the CCV connection here. There we go. And looks like we have one giant nut there. Oh, goodness. All right, one more connector here. Here's what we have here. The starter is right over there two hard coolant pipes that we need to replace, oil filter housing, and you can see inside of the engine a little bit, this is port injected engine, so the valves are pretty clean. Now you're gonna unbolt the oil filter housing. So that's the notorious oil filter housing gasket, a $2 gasket that loves to leak. Oh, this one is actually not that bad. It's not all plastic, so it was replaced. Let's start with the coolant pipes. Oh no, did that break? It did. I guess that's why we are replacing it. O-ring. There we are. All right, now we're gonna flush the head, get all of that pink coolant out. Ah, oh, no, this one broke as well. Oh yeah, it just goes to show that you really need to replace these coolant lines preventively. Man, what kind of crappy plastic is this? There we go, bit of scotch bright. Brand new coolant pipes, and we're gonna use a bit of rhinoplast on the O-rings, just because I wanna be absolutely sure that these are not going to leak. Rhinoplast applied, and the reason I'm using it is because the surface on the engine is not in the greatest condition. I'm not really sure if it's going to seal properly, but with this, it's going to seal 100%. We're gonna replace the rest of the coolant lines a bit later. Make sure this is nice and clean, otherwise it won't seal properly. Brand new Venus line, gasket, and oil pressure switch. We have a dowel here and here that we need to line up and then push the housing in. Oil pressure switch. These can fail, causing a massive oil leak. Ever since I saw that on Alpina, I am now replacing them preventively. The Vanos line. Ouch. And now the action is gonna move underneath of the car. We need to replace the cats, the oil pan gasket, and the flex joint. That means dropping the entire exhaust system, the subframe, and removing the prop shaft. I've been soaking these for days. Oh, that actually came out. Yes. Unbelievable. All four came out. Oh, look at that. Big ball of rust. Ah! Get lost. No one likes you. Divorce! More divorce!
Good, it missed my head. <coughs> and then if I straighten you, perfect. And you can chill out on the side, relax. Here's how this professional job went down. Unbolted the exhaust and pushed it to the side. And now we have plenty of space to do whatever we need. $3 question, do we have a leaking steering rack? What do you think? And nope, the steering rack is good. We're also going to overhaul the entire suspension, so I'm gonna bolt all of the suspension components that are bolted to the subframe so we can remove it. Let's pop the tie rod. <sighs> ah, there you go. This is why we are going to overhaul the entire suspension. Most of these components are original and as you can see, very shot. This one is cracked as well. Unplug the sensor on the steering rack. And now I'm gonna copy paste the same on the other side. We need to unbolt this power steering line that'll come down with the subframe. Ouch. Is there an end here? Unbolt the power steering line. Now I need to disconnect the steering column. Yes, we're gonna disconnect it from underneath. Now we can undo the engine mount bolts. We need to put back the engine hook here. First the thermostat needs to go back in. And this is the attachment point where we're going to support the engine from above. The engine is in the air and supported. Now we can start loosening subframe bolts. All right, that's the steering column disconnected, which I previously forgot to disconnect. This plastic is catching here. There we go, the subframe is out. Okay, I'm gonna start spraying rust loser on the exhaust manifold nuts. They look rusty. First, I'm gonna go around with brake cleaner and compressed air and just clean around the perimeter. I also forgot to detach the oil dipstick. Okay. Okay, we need to unbolt the power steam pump as well. Okay, swing it out of the way, like that. Now we can pull it out. Hello. Yep, that's one varnished engine. And with that side of varnish, we are going to end the first part here. In the next one, we are going to replace the rod bearings, address auto issues, reassemble it, and see how it runs after a major surgery. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, perhaps consider subscribing as we have more Wrench Fest episodes coming up on this project. See you then. Mm -hmm.